Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing um, pathological cardiac hypertrophy. Okay, so we're just discussing the effect of uh, beta-1 stimulation on cardiomyocytes and why it produces an increased force of contraction. Okay, so we're at the moment discussing the cyclic AMP signal that we're going to get within our cardiomyocytes. So, we've discussed the calcium signal. And basically, what you find happens within cardiomyocytes is that when you stimulate them with beta-1 uh, agonists, such as noradrenaline, uh, the calcium signal does not just go up and stay... Well, sorry, we're talking about cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP signal does not just remain at some constant like that. Instead, what you see is that cyclic AMP goes down when the calcium goes up, and then it comes back up when the calcium goes down. So you see something that's the exact uh, complement, basically, of the calcium signal. Okay, so that line that I've drawn there is wrong. This is the correct way that cyclic AMP levels vary within the cell as time goes on. So they oscillate, and they oscillate out of phase with the calcium signal. Okay, so this is the cyclic AMP levels within the cell. And this is only when you have activated the beta-1 adrenergic receptor. Before you've activated the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, cyclic AMP will just be really low and just continue to be really low. Uh, so once you've activated the beta-1 receptor, you get these oscillations in, calcium, in, sorry, in cyclic AMP level. Okay, so why is this? Well, basically, it's because... Uh, when calcium goes up, it inhibits the adenylylcyclase isoforms that you have in the heart. So I told you that the adenylylcyclase isoforms that we have in the heart are either adenylylcyclase uh, 5 or adenylylcyclase 6. So let me draw another picture of it here. So here's our adenylylcyclase enzyme with these two membrane-spanning regions here. And now what I've drawn, in, you might notice I've changed the way I've drawn this so that I can show the C1A portion dimerized with the C2A portion. So this is the active enzyme where this C2A portion here is actually dimerized with the C1A portion there. So we've actually got this active adenylylcyclase enzyme now. So this is either adenylylcyclase 5 or adenylylcyclase 6. Now, at the center of the actual catalytic portion of the adenylylcyclase, there is a magnesium ion, which I'll show in this, as this green dot here. So this green dot at the center of this active portion of the adenylylcyclase, this is a magnesium 2 plus cation. And this is actually really important in the function of the enzyme. So when the ATP comes in, it binds with the magnesium ion because ATP has three phosphate groups on which are negatively charged. So let me just show this. So um, if we draw, draw a quick little diagram for what ATP looks like. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Now, adenosine is just the organic base adenine. So this square represents the organic base adenine uh, bound to a ribose sugar. So when this is the ribose sugar, this is the adenine organic base, and when you bind adenine to a ribose uh, sugar, uh, it's called adenosine. Okay. So then we want adenosine triphosphate, so we want three phosphate groups stuck on here. One, two, three, and I'll just denote them as these little balls sticking off the side here. Okay, so these are all phosphate groups. Right, so what's going to happen is this ATP is going to be coming and coordinate and with the magnesium ion, and it's because these phosphate groups here, they all have a negative charge, okay? So they will bind to the positively charged magnesium cation. Now, what will then happen is this molecule will be converted into cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate. So let me show this happening. Here's the ribose sugar here with the adenine organic base attached to it, then it's fifth carbon up here, and then this one phosphate now attached there. And basically, this is cyclic AMP. So you've had chopped off the two terminal phosphates. And by the way, the phosphates attached to the adenosine are labeled the alpha, 
the beta and the gamma phosphates. So you've chopped off the beta and the gamma phosphates. They're over here. Okay, and this is pyrophosphate, PPI, two phosphate groups linked together. Then you've taken this one remaining phosphate, the alpha phosphate, and you haven't just let it sit up here. Uh, that would be adenosine monophosphate. And instead, what you've done is you've bound it down to this third carbon of the uh, ribose ring down here to create cyclic adenosine monophosphate because you've got this new cycle here. So it's not just adenosine monophosphate, it's cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Okay, and now what has to happen is once you've performed this conversion, they both have to leave. Now, these phosphate groups still have a negative charge, so how do you get them to leave? Well, basically what happens is other groups from the proteins which uh, make up the enzyme come and surround the magnesium ion and stop it from interacting with these uh, substrates. Okay, so let me expand on that a little bit more. So basically, if this is a magnesium cation here, it can have things bound to it coming from above, coming from below, and then it can have four things bound to it in a ring around it like this, which I'll draw like this. So you can have one thing in each of the corners here. So basically, you can have these six bonds um, around the magnesium ion. Okay, and if these six bonds are already occupied, then the pyrophosphate and the cyclic AMP can't interact. So basically, groups from the protein come in and interact with the magnesium ion to stop it from being able to interact with the pyrophosphate and the cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Now, what happens is when calcium goes up in the cytoplasm of the cell, it's going to displace the magnesium from this uh, active site of the um, adenylylcyclase 5 or adenylylcyclase 6 enzyme. So the magnesium gets oinked out and calcium goes in basically. Now, calcium functions just as well in its job uh, within the enzyme. So it brings in the ATP, the ATP is then broken down to cyclic AMP and pyrophosphate. The problem is then in this leaving portion because calcium is a bigger ion than magnesium. So let's draw calcium here. So it can coordinate more things around it than the magnesium. It can coordinate eight things around it. And let me try and show you where these eight things will be. So if you draw a cube around the calcium ion, like so. Okay, so here's this cube around the calcium ion. Whoops. We'll draw one back there, one back there one back there. Okay, so if you draw this cube around the calcium ion, then if you imagine one thing sitting in each of the corners of the cube, you've got eight corners, and those are where you can position things bound to the calcium, basically. So, you can position eight things around the calcium ion. Now, what will happen again is six things will come in from the protein, and they'll interact with the calcium just as they did the magnesium. The problem is that doesn't fill all of the binding sites of the calcium like it did the magnesium. It fills six of them and two of them are still vacant. And basically you can stick this pyrophosphate in those two other ones. One of the phosphates in one and the other phosphate in the other. So what happens is the pyrophosphate molecule ends up sticking to the calcium ion and won't leave the active site of the enzyme. And if the pyrophosphate's sticking there, then another ATP molecule can't come in. So it basically inhibits the adenylylcyclase enzyme. Okay, so the point of that story was just to tell you how calcium inhibits the adenylylcyclase 5 and the adenylylcyclase 6 enzyme. So when the calcium goes up in the cytoplasm of the cell, that's going to stop the activity of these enzymes, even though the um, noradrenaline is still bound to the beta-1 receptor and is still activating the alpha-S uh, GTP subunits, uh, which are then activating the adenylcyclases. So even though that's happening, the calcium is displacing the magnesium and that's stopping the function of them. So cyclic AMP then goes down because there will be um, phosphodiesterase enzymes in the cytoplasm, which will break it down. So in the interim, whilst you're not making any cyclic AMP, 
it will just be broken down so its level will grow down and then when the calcium goes back down the adenylylcyclases will set up activity again and take the cyclic AMP back up so you get these outer phase oscillations with the calcium and these outer phase oscillations in the cyclic AMP are actually very important when we consider how it's going to promote um, uh, inotropy, positive inotropic effect within the cardiomyocytes so let's see how it actually acts on these um, cardiomyocytes then. So let's just have a basic reminder of uh, the machinery of excitation-contraction coupling, basically. Uh, the machinery that generates the calcium signal. Right, so if we have our cardiomyocyte here, here's a T-tubule, okay? And in the T-tubule, you have... Uh, well, in the membrane of the cell as a whole, rather than just in the T-tubule, you have L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. So sitting here is an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. So I'll label this up. L-type VGCC for short, voltage-gated calcium channel. And these channels are also known as the dihydropyridine receptors, or the DHPRs, because they are sensitive to the dihydropyridine drugs such as uh, nifedipine. Okay, uh, so I'll colour this in red. Now, when the action potential comes to this portion of the membrane, what will happen is it will cause this channel to open. Okay, and when this channel opens, it will allow calcium to move into the cell. So in comes calcium. Now, what you will then have is facing the membrane where you have the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, you'll have a little projection from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this structure here now is meant to represent the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the organelle that in other cells would be called the endoplasmic reticulum. But in since it's in a muscle cell, it has the prefix sarco instead of endo. So sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is often just abbreviated to SR for short. Okay, now the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a store for calcium. You have a lot of calcium stored within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, this calcium that comes in through the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, this is not the calcium that will actually cause the contraction of the cardiomyocyte. Well, it's calcium. Calcium is calcium, of course, but... Um, Basically, not enough calcium comes in through the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels to actually cause uh, contraction of the cardiomyocyte. So the calcium that comes in uh, through this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel is what's known as a calcium sparklet. So you get a little bit of a rise in calcium around this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. And that rise in calcium around the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel is what's known as a calcium sparklet. Okay. Now, basically, the membrane where you have these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels is very closely opposed to uh, the membrane of one of these processes off the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and this is the concept of a calcium synapse. So, this is a calcium synapse. And the concept of a calcium synapse is very similar to the concept of a synapse between two neurons. Basically, this is like the presynaptic neuron letting in this calcium, which is equivalent to a neurotransmitter, which is going to diffuse across this gap here, which is known as the dyadic cleft, okay? So this is the dyadic cleft, okay? And it's going to diffuse across the dyadic cleft and bind to receptors on the equivalent of the postsynaptic neuron over here. Now, the type of receptor it's going to bind to on the postsynaptic neuron, or this process of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which I'll draw in uh, turquoise here. It's going to bind to type 2 ryanodine receptors on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So these are type 2 ryanodine receptors. Okay, and type 2 ryanodine receptors uh, are um, basically gated by calcium. So when calcium binds to them, they are activated to open. Okay? So this phenomenon of the calcium spark that diffusing across the dyadic cleft and activating a receptor on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is then going to open and release calcium from the SR, this is known as calcium-induced calcium release because 
basically the calcium that has come in uh, through the L-type voltage gated calcium channel is going to cause the release of more calcium from uh, the SR lumen here. Okay, now, um, the calcium that comes out from the SR lumen, let's just quickly discuss this. So basically, what you find is that the type 2 ranadine receptor, okay, here, is not just sitting on its own, okay? So it's basically in a complex sitting nearby other proteins. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.